On today's episode, we are breaking down the AFC East that includes monsters like the Bills. And Jason has some very interesting things to say about the New York Jets. We also have a best ball breakdown segment giving you our favorite later round picks. Subscribe to this channel, like the video, leave us some comments, and enjoy. Foot Clan draft season is rapidly approaching. I mean, we're talking August is here in just a few weeks. The ultimate draft kit. Our draft guide that's being updated throughout the entire offseason is available right now. You can get in ultimatedraftkit.com. I'm telling, like, I just spent some time updating my players, moving some guys up. I don't want to tell you what I did because you got to go check it out ultimatedraftkit.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore. And Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday, July 21st. The Fantasy Footballers podcast back with you mike wright jason moore andy holloway the trifecta inching our way towards august when we will be a five oh, day man. a week <sighs> podcast we are doing a live show in los angeles here on the 30th and when we return gentlemen we will be five days a week how did we get here i don't know how time works but here we are you will wake up in the morning yeah. and you'll say, is there a show from the fantasy footballers? And the answer will be yes. Yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, AFC East breakdown on today's episode of the show. Some news to talk about. Doing some best ball breakdown at the end of the show with Underdog Fantasy. And uh, guys, I don't I don't know how to tell you this. Just, just rip the Band-Aid off, yeah. man. Make it quick. Very positive responses to the potential deuce cam. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so right. I don't know how to feel. I don't know how that reflects on the audience at hand that they were so into that idea. But, um, you know, we'll, we're going to put the producers on camera very I, soon. I feel like they should be backlit. And when we finally reveal oh. the deuce cam, it's just their silhouettes. silhouettes. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's what do you guys think about the best. that? Love it. Love it. Okay. What about like masks? Can we also contort their voices? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this is not Brooks. Um, <laughs> but we'll see. It'll be coming soon. Twitter at the FF Ballers. Mike mentioned it at the top. The Ultimate Draft Kit available right now. UltimateDraftKit.com. If you want to be a part of our fantasy football community, which means access to the Megalobowl tournament coming up, <sighs> extra episodes of the show. <sighs> I mean, there's a lot of there's almost eighteen thousand of you that are a Soon part of it. I will wake. <laughs> yes, yes, the megalobol lurking from my slumber. in the in, in the shadows. That is jointhefoot.com. Uh, a lot of premium in season perks there as well. But if you want to be a part of the community, you want to support the podcast. We are independent. We have been for seven years. That is jointhefoot.com. Let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. Just a couple pieces of news to talk about. Ian Rappaport said there's some optimism that, some optimism that Michael Thomas will be cleared early in training camp. That news doesn't hit me with a tremendous amount of like optimism because it's not a lock. And when it's not a lock after three seasons, I, I guess yeah. I just feel like you're going to have to do stuff on the field during the season, Michael. Yeah, I mean, th this news really comes from Nick Underhill, who was saying that there's been a lot of positive vibes around, and he's a very plugged-in beat reporter uh, for the Saints. And he's, you know, he's he's shared when it's been pessimistic. So I do, I do care about this news because – you know, we're we're talking about underdog today. Michael Thomas has fallen yeah. so far, and I I you know look, he's going behind DeAndre Hopkins, who you know is missing 
six games. Michael Thomas has a chance to play 17. Um, I, I, you know, I obviously we want to see him. We want to see him on the field. We want to see him at training camp. It's been two years on an ankle. And so I think we are pessimistic, but it's good that the vibes are getting better from the saints. There are. Yeah. I mean, you're right. There are so many question marks around what it means to have him healthy that I think it compounds itself. Is there is the injury question? And then the, okay, let's pretend he's healthy today. What does that translate to? How often do they throw the football? What is Jameis Winston's health, which also seems to be reporting uh, in the positive direction? But the over-under right now on Michael Thomas is 800 receiving yards. So that's where oh. the line's set. So, so that's the same level of trepidation. You drop Michael Thomas and you get 800 receiving yards, you're not very happy. Yeah, well, I, mean, I mean, where are you taking him in a draft? Yeah, very late. Like, I mean, yeah, but eight hundred receiving yards. You're not. I, I you know, you're going to enter the category of like an eleventh round. Christian Kirk gets you eight hundred yeah, receiving fair. yards. I mean, that's uh, forty seven a game. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, that being said, we all have him statted out for basically over nine hundred at least, um, which you know still is not the Michael Thomas of of old. I would never bet a receiving line on Michael Thomas until I know about the health. I guess if I had to bet it, I would just bet under because unders are the smart bet this time of year due to injury. Are you drafting Michael Thomas ahead of Chris Olave? I have been drafting Michael Thomas ahead of Chris Olave. I yes. would, yeah. Uh, and then this is some news. You know, one of the players, and this happens during the summer. Sometimes, like our show, all three of us ended up independently slightly below ADP on Najee Harris. One of the players that we have not been extremely – you know, you know, he's not a touted sleeper in the draft kit, but he's a sleeper that's very popular in the community right now. Tight end Albert Aguabanam mm -hmm. of the Denver Broncos. This report comes out. They spent a uh, a draft pick, third round pick on Greg Dulcich, tight end, pass catching tight end. And he's a stud, very good like, tight. End. I mean, he the the argument before the draft was, you know, Trey McBride or or Greg Dulcich, like. And I mean the the NFL went the the route of Trey McBride with with uh, the second round capital, but Dulcich not far behind in the third. And and so right now the trendy Albert O pick, maybe those expectations being tempered by the report that Greg Dulcich will compete for the starting job, and it's been reported he's the more natural pass catcher of the two. He's a stud, and also got first team reps. Um, uh, so. It's something to watch because the truth is is this is not a message saying, oh, maybe Greg Dulcich will be super valuable. Right. right. This is a message saying maybe neither will, which happens a lot. And, you know, Albert Aguabanam has not had – he's been second on the depth chart behind Noah Fant. So this is not like an established presence in the offense. If you look at Arizona and you say, oh, the hype about Trey McBride drafted ahead of Greg Dulcich, you have an established Zach Ertz. You have a well-paid Zach Ertz. It's more murky in Denver because Aguemanom's dealt with injuries. They intentionally went out and got Dulcich. They try, you know. So I do think that this could make it just a not valuable position. Yeah, I mean, it's it, Dulcich is not going to come and light the wor world on fire as a rookie tight end. No rookie tight ends do, but he can do enough to make Albert O <clears throat> just a, a bad pick. And there's a lot of you know, you know, you've you've got Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy and Tim Patrick. That's why I was off Albert O before even the Greg Dulcich news came out. It's like there are three, and like the, the I mean, in the fantasy community, we're like, is it is it Jerry Judy? Is it Cortland Sutton? I mean, that's and that's a fair conversation to have. And it's Tim Patrick is also very good. Like so, to have three, like. Really solid wide receiving options. It's and two, KJ it's Hamler's there too. Two well, great. We'll, we'll see if he's back. I mean, he's, he's going to be back. Javante and Melvin Gordon could catch passes too. So yeah, uh, the tight end position is not the premium one here for the Denver no. Broncos. And so if I'm taking a late round tight end sleeper just to close this loop, it's a Cole Komet locked in as the one. Yes, it's uh, David and Joku paid and locked yes. in as the one. Uh, so that's something to pay attention to when you're when you're drafting and you're looking for a sleeper any other news we need to we do talk have a about? little bit of breaking news okay did uh, it come through the old sleeper Brown. yeah it did come through the sleeper uh the 49ers have officially given jimmy garoppolo the green light to go find a trade 
And <gasps> what? Yeah, well, like I mean, you know how they were like, well, we we had an offer of two second round picks for Jimmy <laughs> Garoppolo, which okay, Kyle Shanahan, if that's true, now you're just a really really big dum dum because you I I don't think you're gonna get two twos for Jimmy Garoppolo at this point, but it, it, that's also coming up again because of the the injury or the uh, the surgery that Jimmy Garoppolo had. It seems like he's you know. He's, been, he's cleared. been cleared to start yeah. practicing, so that will he'll be on the move, uh, one way or the other, through trade, through cut. Something's going to happen. I mean, if he's sitting on a dynasty waiver wire, he could get a starting job. He could be the starting could. quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, and I do think it's possible he's the starting quarterback for the Houston Texans. Also possible, but I don't find would, I don't know many other teams. That would be so unfair to Davis Mills. Yeah. I mean, Davis Mills showed everything you wanted for a third-round quarterback. Uh, Not everything. I, he, they won four games, and they were, like, dead last in every offensive statistical category. So I think we saw flashes, but I would still understand a team and a head coach wanting to keep their job. Well, it's a brand-new coach, so. Yeah, that's what I mean. A brand, look, you can lose it in one year. Yes. Lovey Smith could be gone. Jimmy Garoppolo is much more proven. Agreed. But you said it wouldn't matter if he – it wouldn't matter to your Brandon Cooks. Brandon, no, it would be lateral. I mean, I'm already – I already love Brandon I would feel Cooks. terrible for Davis Mills, too. I'm with you on that. Yeah. I'm not saying it's the move they should make, but they could make. Is there any other team that even – Kyle, is there any team that you think is in contention for Jimmy oh, G? Oh, come on, Carolina. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> Just no, no, one, no one else needs him. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where the leverage is lost by San Francisco. I don't know. The Jets could use him. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't I mean, make any oh, look, sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense because they got a lot of good weapons like, and no quarterback. It makes sense, like if they want to, you know, win games. R right, 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 right. Yeah, but if they just want to make sure that the young quarterback there is not good, they could do. We're that. talking the Jets today. Which okay, well, I'm let's, now, let's do it. I'm now not looking forward to at all. <laughs> after Mister Davis Mills over here can't get behind the hope of Zach Wilson, but uh, let's kick it off. Let's get divisional. I don't want to be boxed into the corner of defending Zach Wilson. Then don't do it. But somebody has to like temper the hate on this show. I had to do it with Josh Allen once, guys. You did. Don't make me do it again. Well, let's talk Josh Allen and the Bills. Yeah, eleven and six last year. They hit their preseason win total. They were 0-5 in one-score games, so they were basically in every game because they only lost six games on the year. So they only had one game that was not a one-score game that they lost. That's impressive. That was a great season. Uh, their, their win totals at 11.5 going into the year. They were dominant on all the offensive categories, fourth in pace of play, third in points per game, fifth in total yards, fifth in pass attempts, 13th in rush attempts because – it makes sense. They throw the football a lot. When you have a team that throws as much as the Bills, I mean, they they just don't want to run the ball, which is glorious for both real life and fantasy, and yet you're still top half of the NFL, that means you play fast. You get a lot of extra plays in, um, which matters for, for fantasy. Yes, it does. Uh, their defense was outstanding. And the one big offseason coaching change was the loss of Brian Dable. Mm-hmm. Um, you also had Bruce Arians leaving in Tampa, so you have a couple of offenses that were like well-oiled machines losing kind of crucial pieces, but you got Byron Leftwich still there. You have a ton of stability on this offense, and obviously the Stallion running the show. Whoa. Excellent. So do you have any concerns about the loss of Brian Dable? No, no concerns whatsoever. I, I have no concerns over the loss of Emmanuel Sanders, Cole Beasley, Brian Dable. The, Josh Allen has proven that he is – uh, you know, um, among the best of the best. He will run this offense. He'll run it quickly. He'll run it efficiently. Um, and I think <clears throat> you want pieces of it. Sure. What does that say about a Brian Dable? Who you can look at the Giants with optimism because of his arrival, but then we don't think it's a negative impact. And Like if you were adding Brian Dable to the Bills. I think it's more of like, so Ken Dorsey who took over, he was the quarterback coach for, sure. for several years. So, so to, to me it's more just... You have uh, you have a feller here who was able to learn under Brian Dable, and uh, I mean, I, unless there's something I haven't seen here about the Buffalo Bills 
trying to change what the offense was over the last couple of years. I think they'll just it, it like there's definitely some variables of of Dorsey, you know, new at this, but overall it's it's it, it goes to Josh Allen and your your confidence in him as a quarterback as just a uh, just such an imposing quarterback who can take over the game running or passing so that you, you just feel confident in what they're up to. Yeah, he was the number one quarterback last year in fantasy, which makes it two consecutive years for Josh Allen. And I believe last year's stat total was maybe the fourth highest fantasy output at quarterback in wow. the Super Bowl era. So this was a prolific year in a year where people questioned whether he could do it again. They lose Emmanuel Sanders, Cole Beasley. They add Jamison Crowder, O.J. Howard to the passing game. James Cook in the second round, a rookie running back. And so, you know, Josh Allen is that special type of fantasy quarterback that wins you your matchup. Mm -hmm. He can go out there and put up 33-plus points like he did seven times last year. And, um, wow, this is stunning. Five weeks as the QB1, more than Herbert, Brady, Mahomes, Rodgers, Stafford, and Dak. He combined has, he has to do that again though if you're going to take him in the second round that's that's uh that's a lot of quiche there for a fantasy quarterback yeah uh will he no he won't he won't have that many he, uh, will he finish as the quarterback one yes will Good he chance. have yeah uh, you know that that's how i've got him projected but is he worth it uh, he's not worth a second round pick uh i i don't think so not when you have uh, the the Jalen Hurts, Kyler, Trey Lance mobile quarterbacks who aren't going to be that far away from Josh Allen later in drafts, and then you get a first round or a, a second round, a third round running back wide receiver and, and build your depth around your team in other ways. I, I still think it's a mistake to take him very, very high, even though I assume he's going to finish as the number one quarterback. Uh, last quarterback to do it three years in a row, Dante Culpepper. Wow. So. I would have thought Rod – oh, Rodgers kept doing the thing where he was one, then two. Yes. Then one, then two. Yeah, he checked the microphone. Uh, Devin Singletary was the running back, too, for the final four weeks of the season. Man. this uh, th So this is where it's good because Josh Allen, not really confusing on what he's going to bring. What the crap is Devin Singletary going to be where they – the the drafting of, of James Cook – Clear indicator that they are officially moving away from, uh, from Zach, Zach Moss. Moss. I don't blame you for blanking <laughs> on that name. I mean, what a boring player. Uh, it didn't work out, uh, but they it was just the, the running backs. <laughs> thank you. The Bills running backs saw 15% of the team's targets. That was fourth lowest in the NFL. Like That's, that's not enough to give you a really high-end running back one. Not that... Singletary is being drafted anything like that but him and James Cook are being drafted right next to each other because the fantasy community is like ah you've you have fooled me with Evan Singletary before and yet he was so dominant to the end of the season where are you guys at in the the ADP of the eighth round for Devin Singletary is can he continue that end of season at all? Yeah, I've I've actually been drafting both of these running backs, and I like Devin Singletary in the eighth round. That's where you get a drop off from some of those great wide receivers, and and you're kind of in a middling tier of a uh, lot of question marks at wide receivers. You're grabbing a guy who was really really good down the stretch, and yes, I they they, they before that was bad. Like before that, if you had been playing him, yes, he finished as the RB eleven in week two and twenty two. But in week before 10, but it, was, it was bad. Before that, the the constant thing for him, you know, was forty percent, forty four percent, twenty six, forty five percent, thirty four percent snaps. That's how it was to start the year. So yeah, he wasn't that fantasy relevant at the end of the year. Eighty two, ninety three, sixty eight, eighty, seventy six. They said, yes. they said Zach Moss, sit down. Get, yes, they just did. stop it. Um, well, they tried. Somebody else first. Yeah, right. Matt Burita. They was tried there. Matt Burita. So they were, I mean, they were trying hard not to play Singletary. So it's hard to say that, you know, through, after three years that this is a lock, but the cost is very minimal. Yeah, in the eighth round, the starting running back for the Bills, I think, is a valuable gamble. Um, what you saw him do down the stretch, and it wasn't like, like, yeah, he beat up on Atlanta and New Jersey, but he also had great games against New England, Carolina, and Tampa Bay's run defenses, which were great. Um, so I, in the eighth round, I'm fine drafting Devin Singletary because he's not your running back one, your running back two. You're taking a shot at a great offense, and really, 
Um, the, the same could be said about Cook. When you're late and you're drafting a bench running back, when you want a okay, maybe he, maybe they were scrambling and looking. I think both guys are just. It's a risky pick that is worth taking because they're both talented and on a great offense. It feels a little bit like the struggle we've had in Kansas City in recent years, finding peripheral value where, okay, Clyde wasn't going to be just the guy, so then you do, do you grab Darrell Williams, does, you know, Jarek McKinnon get a draft selection, where you're trying to find that player that – by nature of the offense, gets a lot of opportunities. But the one troubling thing in Buffalo is that Josh Allen is going to soak up a lot of goal line. Yes. And they're not afraid to throw the ball to maybe the most reliable pass catcher in the game in Stephon Diggs around the, the goal line. So Diggs, very safe. Being drafted in the top of the second round everywhere. Yeah, and, and I've I've taken him at the end of the first a couple of times. I think he should – be in the conversation to me with the top three guys, the Cooper Cup, Jamar Chase, and Justin Jefferson trifecta. Diggs, you know, there's there's a lot of lost targets to this offense. Emmanuel Sanders is gone. Cole Beasley is gone. And so obviously we've had so much offseason talk about Gabriel Davis. I love Gabriel Davis, depending on where he's being drafted, which is <laughs> sure. wildly different depending on what platform you're on. But I think Diggs is just, he's guaranteed to be great. He could have had more touchdowns than he had last year based on his, you know, end zone targets and is just, you know, he, they just paid him a ton of money too. So I, I love grabbing Diggs if he's in the second round. Gabe Davis, we call him the 35 reception man because that's what he's done both of his first two years. He's going to need to do a lot more than 35, uh, put up a lot more than 35 receptions to deliver this year on the promise, but it's that potential third year breakout. It's the uh, explosiveness we saw in the, very end of the season when he saw most of the snaps. He saw it in the, the playoff. What was it, a four-touchdown game? Like, mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, a lot of things have to bounce the right way of not just a player having a great game. You need other people to screw up and, and help you get to that point. But it was the same thing as, the, as Devin Singletary where the team favored Emmanuel Sanders, which at the beginning of the season, Emmanuel Sanders had some juice. He was helping that team out. And then as the season progressed, the snaps started to go up and up for Gabe Davis, and he looks like he is a full-time player. You know, bigger, uh, like not not huge, but 6'2", 210. That's, I mean, that's a decent-sized wide receiver. And for me, the Gabe Davis situation is not even, like, arguing, is, is Gabe Davis a great top-tier wide receiver? I, I don't care. Do the Bills view him as their second wide receiver because Josh Allen is going to throw a whole bunch of touchdowns and and yardage? So I think that Gabe Davis, as long as the ADP is not out of control, which in your home league, if you're listening right now and you got a home league draft in August, he should be at the point where it is well worth the the risk of his ADP. Just be be careful. Don't get out of control and let the, the hopes and dreams of what Gabe Davis can become have you drafting him in like – the fifth round when you have true known number one wide receiver still on the board. Yeah, and in, in underdog, he is – I mean, you're getting him at the beginning of the fourth sometimes. He's, yeah, that's yeah. no thank you. His ADP is 43.5 right now, and it's – I mean, it, it, what it says to me, the, you know, the, 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 the sharp minds, the money there is, is in on Gabriel Davis, and I don't think he returns – like when you take that pick, he has to be great. You're basically drafting yes, his ceiling. no – but in your home leagues, the, your your fantasy football leagues, he's going to be there in the sixth, seventh round, and I would I would scoop that up left left and right. What, sort about, of reminds, what about center? Not center. Well, we'd need three rounds for that. Oh, be, you know what I mean? Okay. So it's like sixth he round in left, slot. seventh round right, eighth round would be the center. Okay. okay, uh, okay. It reminds me a little bit of the the, the Marvin Jones. I mean, Marvin Jones was the big touchdown target in Cincinnati before he had an opportunity for more snaps. They get two four touchdown games on that team. Gabe Davis, uh, like you said, if, if he's in the seventh, eighth round, then yes, it's going to be interesting. Jamison Crowder will be interesting under the same premise. I mean, if Cole Beasley was a relevant fantasy asset with a 19% target share and he's being replaced by a younger than you think he is, Jamison Crowder. Wait. Well, do you want to guess? I do. Okay. Because I, I would I would have been sure, like, he's 28. 
Oh, then you are uh, yeah. under. <laughs> yeah, he's so, twenty. He's twenty nine. So oh. older than you expected. Oh, okay. Uh, so okay. Well, twenty nine is not a young. I was r just really surprised. Yeah, but he's been around the block yeah. a lot. I mean, you, I, you would have been thinking, you know, thirty one, thirty two year old receiver with the career he's had compared to Cole Beasley, who is thirty three, spring chicken. There you go. I mean, that's a good example. Uh, oh, also, my also, Dawson Knox is part of this offense and had a breakout year last year. I'm looking at Jamison Crowder's profile on the fantasyfootballers.com. I totally forgot. Remember when he was Jamison Target? <laughs> what? We that was just, his name? Yeah, that we had. There was the year because he was getting so many freaking targets in Washington. <laughs> no, I don't even remember that. <laughs> what a bad nickname! Why would we do that, Jamison Target? In the moment, it was great, Jason. Yeah, it sounds so bad now. Well, because he's not getting targets. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, or one, because it wasn't targets. It was just James and Target. I, it'll be interesting <laughs> because Gabe Davis, like I said, is, 35 is the reception peak of his career. So if it doesn't come to fruition, if he ends up being a lower volume touchdown t kind of wide receiver, which is very possible, Jameson Crowder and Dawson Knox could be uh, more involved than we saw last year, sharing some of that Cole Beasley target share. Yeah, I mean, the reality here is uh, it could have been summed up. And Not even Jameson targets? No, just right. target. Jameson targets sounds okay. Yeah. Jameson target is like, a, that's the, that is the. That's the new line coming out. Right. Like, at target. <laughs> this is the target. Jameson targets? At, in, like, in the city of Jameson. Have you guys mm. been to the Jameson target? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what it sounds like to me. But basically, draft bills. Yeah, Dawson sure, Knox sure. is the tight end uh, nine right now. Okay. Are you I'm, comfortable there in the ninth round? I Yes. Would I'm, you take the shot? I'm willing to do that, yes. They do start the year on the road against the defending Super Bowl champion. So that'll be a fun game. All right, quick break. Back with the Patriots. New England, 10-7 and seven last year with a preseason win total of nine, so they outperformed that. Three and three in one score games. They're projected for eight and a half wins, so that went down. Yeah, uh, nonsense. Which could be a product of... Dolphins are Dolphins, better. yeah, the Dolphins. And the, bill, the Bills' win projection is up. Yeah. Dolphins' win projection is up. I, I'm fairly sure of that. Maybe it's the same as last year, but... New England last year, sixth in points per game. Does that compute with no. what you saw on the field? No, it does not. Yeah, they, it, to, as, a, as a team, they scored a lot, it, but this isn't one of those fast-paced teams. And so for fantasy, you didn't get as many plays run. It was, it was very efficient. I mean, tons of field goals, right? Nick Folk was great. Oh, I forgot Damian Harris was out of – like, Damian Harris was 15 rushing touchdowns. Yeah, 15 Whoa, rushing. Oh, baby. I mean, it, it was a really slow style of we are going to play old-school smash-mouth football and defense, mm -hmm. have a game manager in rookie Mac Jones who did everything they asked him to do very efficiently um, for a rookie. And the question now is, is this going to be a similar – style of offense is this going to be a slow smash you in the mouth type of team or with year two mac jones do they start opening things up more do they a lot you know they went and they got Devonte parker they drafted the fastest player in the draft at wide receiver uh in taekwon and so do they open up the passing game and speed up a little bit or do you think it's still molasses yeah i mean it, the 28th in pace of play last year and i don't expect much different I really don't. You're, you're going to be more effective with a second-year quarterback and those weapons, but, I mean, they were 14th in passing yards. Do I think it's going up? No, they're going to be middle of the pack, I think, in that department. They know how to run the football, but, you know, part of that points per game is they blow people out. They've had these games where they dominate on the defensive side, second in points against, 54-13, 50-10, 45-7, so, to 7. so when the going was good, it was yeah. good. But uh, from a fantasy perspective, it's still very hard to – each position group is very difficult to break down. Like, I'll take Devontae Parker over the rest. Me too. I'll take Damian Harris over the rest. I will as well. But I don't know if – I mean, let, let me see where the draft cost of Damian Harris is right now. Six-round pick, RB26 after a 15-touchdown season. I believe it's the final year of his contract. Is that yes, right? It is. Um, 
which is, I mean, that's the, what, Josh Jacobs is in that situation too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, he's a great runner, doesn't catch the football. I'm not too concerned about James White, James White's return because of the injury and just, I don't know how involved he'll be, but Ramondre Stevenson was very impressive. He, Ramondre Stevenson is very interesting because uh, you're at that, you're at the point in the double digit rounds where the starting running backs are long gone. And if you're just trying to look for some depth of, I can see, I can see the path forward for Ramondre Stevenson to be great because on the field he was he was excellent. He he can be a pass catcher if James White is going to miss time. I it's very possible that they turn to Stevenson for that type of the role in the short term, and then Damian Harris is always like most Patriot running backs, one or two fumbles away from well we're going to put Stevenson in now and see what happens. But you get those, you get some some high scoring games and and someone with juice, a younger player, Stevenson in the tenth. I I think it's worth taking a shot. You're gonna have to hold on and see what happens, so that you're you're probably taking up a roster spot for a few weeks. But I I think he can really elevate a team towards the second half because of how he played when Damian Harris was injured, which is another concern for Damian Harris. I th you started to see the way they were going to use these guys, which they would just give a drive to Ramondre. It would be a full drive. It would be right. first, second, and third down to Ramondre Stevenson. You also saw games where they had it, you know, it was out of hand, and they'd take Damian Harris out for the second half or for the fourth quarter. So it's not fun to try to figure that out uh, each and every week. So that's why you see the depleted – like for a team that runs the ball as much as they do, to see their first running back off the board in the sixth round. Yes. Who was the running back 13 last year with 15 touchdowns. It is a little weird. Yeah, it is weird. Uh, because – here, here's the reality with Damian Harris. There is a team that Damian Harris is a great draft pick for. Uh, Damian Harris is not – look, it's not going to get better than last year because he doesn't catch the ball. Mm -hmm. He's not going up from 15 touchdowns. So last year was peak Damian Harris' his best year of his career. But if you're telling me 10 touchdowns and a lot of serviceable, usable, startable weeks that you can grab in the sixth round, depending on how you built your team, if you went wide receiver heavy and you've got four – awesome stud wide receivers to start well you could plug Damian Harris in there and no look I'm not trying to swing for the fences and get the running back five here but I'm there's just, a, I'm just there's, taking a single the, but there yeah exactly I'm gonna, I'm gonna put okay. my wide receivers on the bases and just bring in runs um I love you having to do baseball references <laughs> it it felt like I was putting my hand on a cheese grater I'm gonna be honest <laughs> it was not a good time well uh, but like but moving it or just resting it? No, no, you no. Can rest no, on a, a good slide. Okay. A good slide. Uh, I'm going to need several little Band-Aids. Just tons of little band -aids, Just so many little cuts. But the reality is, knowing that he isn't that swing for the fences, he's not going to be better. I have. I don't think I've drafted Damian Harris once because where not. he's going... Rashad Penny or Damian Harris? I would take Damian Harris for the offense, the touchdowns, and all of that. But it's... Where it, where he's going, it's the other positions. It's Jalen Hurts. It's uh, Amon Ross St. Brown. It's guys that I just I like better at other positions in that sixth round than, than Damian Harris. And I'll come back and grab Ramondre in the tenth. No one spends more money on their wide receiver and tight end room than, than New England. They have more money spent there than any other team in football. Yet, if I ask the question, is there one player from the wide receiver room or the tight end room that you'll start every week? Can you give me a name? No. That will be locked into your lineup. No. I mean, is there I, one drafted inside the top 10 rounds? No. 11 rounds? No. I do really like Hunter Henry in best ball because you know he is a touchdown monster. Uh, they, they you know, looked his way last year. He's got a long history. I mean, he's he's been good for fantasy most of his career. So I think he's a good pick in the 11th round. It's, it's rare for someone who um, was a real – you know, positive value player last year to still be drafted so low. So I like I like Henry, and I would agree with you. I'm taking Parker over Jacoby Myers. He, w which was the worst offseason signing last year? Johnny Smith for the money he got paid leaving Tennessee or Julio Jones for the money he got – the trade that they did to acquire him? I John. mean, oh, I would, I would say Julio. Like, Johnny, because we're looking at things from a – fantasy football perspective we're not looking at it as blocking he was he was relegated to being a blocking tight end and the team was eighth in rushing yards and second in rushing touchdowns I mean he he helped the team 
He just doesn't help our teams. Right. The Dolphins were 9-8 and eight last year. They started 1-7. and seven. And unlike Mike's fantasy team, they rallied in hey. the second half of the year. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the rally was not enough to keep Brian Flores around. So uh, they go into the season this year with a projected Vegas win total of Jason? nine. I was very sad because I wanted to dunk on Janu, but he was, in fact, graded as 83.2 in PFF run blocking. So he was he was a very good run blocker. I just <laughs> want. I, why I, did you want to dunk on? So him? that wasn't a fist pump. That was a like darn. That was a darn. That was a dang it. That was a darn. I don't get to besmirch the man, Janu Smith slash you. Were, you. you one one hundred percent. That is correct. Okay. The Dolphins were fifth in pace of play, eighth in pass attempts, but twenty second in points per game. Uh, they did not get it done. Thirtieth in rushing yards. So we we all remember what happened last year. It was a disaster. Uh, trying to watch these running backs piece their way through game after game, whether it's Salvin Ahmed or uh, Miles the Gas Man who ran oh, out of gas, empty gas can. So I mean, they kind of they kind of reworked everything yep. in the offense. They went out and got a offensive minded head coach, Mike McDaniel. Um, they picked up Tyreek Hill, a blockbuster acquisition. Uh, they get a second year Jalen Waddle as part of this offense. And then you have Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mostert, Sonny Michelle, just a re-roll of the running back room. So what's your sentiment about this offense heading into 2022? Are you optimistic like the Dolphins fans are? No, I, I, oh. I think I, well, not like the Dolphins fans are. I, I think it's going to be a good offense. Good, not great, is the way that I classify the Dolphins. I don't think that they are going to light the world on fire and they're going to be the next Chargers. Uh, I don't think Tua is going to be able to take that leap forward. I, I hope I'm wrong, unlike, you know, looking forward to the demise of Janu. Here, I want um, success. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> and, and, but I just, I don't believe that Tua can run a high pace um, you know, like a, a successful offense that is uh, putting up a ton of offensive points. Last year, this was a team where you had a lot of dink and dunk with Jalen Waddle, and that was successful to a degree. And that doesn't remind you of uh, any quarterback in San Francisco who had pretty good amount of success in this system? Sure, but now with Tyreek Hill... Uh, you know, uh, sure. Bring. Uh, I'm bring, just saying, like Jimmy Garoppolo is the is the dink and dunk king over there in San Francisco. Would they bring him over? <laughs> no, but I'm saying like Tua is accurate and he's dinking and dunking, and that's what that's what this offense is. Do you think they're going to that he's going to run kind of a? a I mean, obviously, it was a very run heavy team with the 49ers. Yes. Do you think that's the system they're going to do with the personnel here with Tyreek with Waddle and not you know. Uh, the 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 same level of run blocking you think that uh, you know because the Dolphins aren't known for their great offensive line here the, their offensive line got a massive upgrade they they got Armstead from New Orleans and they got Williams from Dallas like they've they've pieced things together I'm pretty optimistic I am I am as well because you have players that are I mean who's better after the catch than Tyreek Hill who's better after the catch than Jalen Waddle right so you, even Chase Edmonds I mean Chase Edmonds Look, Chase will probably always end up a better real-life player than a fantasy player. But for the purposes of moving the offense down the field, Chase Edmonds has been elite for his quarterback. And so when I look at making life easy on Tua, I see those three pieces plus a head coach that knows how to make life easy. So what that translates to, you know, this is a team with a lot more fantasy options that are being drafted than an offense like New England. Right, Chase is being drafted. Tyreek and Waddle, Gasicki, people have interest in him. Oh, don't do that. So, I I don't know. I don't know what to what that means for Tua, because he's not being drafted. I mean, he's, he's somebody that you can pick up and stream, and maybe take maybe you stash him on your bench on a Sunday morning when the season begins. Because what if they unlock something powerful on offense here? Yeah, I would say don't let my optimism for the Dolphins and the the offensive weapons on the team that doesn't also correlate to me being like ecstatic for Tua, the fantasy quarterback. I just I think that 
the player to a, will be able to handle this system and it's going to be set up for a tremendous amount of success. And there are plenty of examples in history where there are highly drafted, successful uh, skill position players where it didn't correlate to a great fantasy production from the quarterback position. So you might be saying, Oh, like Jimmy well, Garoppolo yeah, last exactly, year. Right, exactly. Where it was great for Debo. And like Kittle was a tight end four. Debo was the wide receiver too. Yeah. Elijah and, Mitchell was a, I don't remember where he finished, but finished very high. Yeah. And Tua right? is not going to be adding 500 rushing yards on the ground to help fantasy value. So um, I, I think my favorite piece here, I, I really, I really like Jalen Waddle because of the Tyreek trade people are forgetting just how good he was but I think my favorite piece lately and I have been getting him left right and center <laughs> there it oh, is yeah there three is. rounds is Chase Edmonds oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in I'm, I'm in man I'm fully in which I was so anti-Chase Edmonds last year and the last few years which phrase do you like more left right and center okay hold on or okay because you've gone yeah, to that no, you've gone left, to that a few left, times right and center. or sets the world on fire which I think might be your new one Mm. Which I know I'm trying to really piece together what that means because it sounds devastating. Well, no, yeah, it's great. It it's yeah. great because it's you become the them. yeah you become the king of the new burnt down world. Yes, mm. um, and you you raise it as you see fit. That's right. <laughs> so I I'm going to take that because I think that's more productive. Okay, um, um, but my but point, you're drafting a lot of chase. I am drafting a lot of chase because Raheem Mostert I don't think is going to be able to. He, he, you know, the health issues he's had, his age, and all of those things, I think he's going to be just a nice ancillary piece. When the offseason started, they went out and they got Chase. Yes. He was one of the first signings. This was from, you know, obvious, obviously uh, the head coach is very familiar in division with where Chase Edmonds has been. The scheme fit. Yeah, the speed. The scheme fit and the speed is perfect to be able to get a starting running back. Like, you, I'm very confident that he is the starter on this team. At the eight nine turn, who can catch passes? Th that's just uh, it feels like stealing. Tyree Kill is a second round pick right now. Oh man, Jalen Waddle is a, a late fourth. Yeah, uh, he had the rookie record for receptions. I know you brought him up. You thought he's, you know, that's still pretty expensive. Wide receiver sixteen off the board for Jalen Waddle. It's not like he is. I I think what Jason was saying that if Tyreek wasn't here, where is Jalen Waddle going? Like Jalen Waddle's probably being drafted in the second. I agree with that, but do you do you like Tyreek at his cost, or do you like Waddle at his cost? Because Tyreek is the wide receiver seven, and if he was still in Kansas City, he'd probably be the wide receiver two. Yeah, <sighs> I mean, uh, I would, I'm going with Waddle out of these two guys. I'll take s someone from a different team <laughs> with my second rounder. Okay, and then Mike Gesicki, Mike, you said it early. I'm out, man. Like O U T. This was I don't. This is franchise tag, Mike. Isiki. Yeah, this is franchise tag. The no long term deal was worked out, and he just we, with the addition of of Tyreek Hill going into the system, I just I do not have faith that Gasicki will be a a, a twenty percent target share guy. Getting okay. just real bad vibes out of there. And then we move on to the uh, the New York Football Jets four and th uh, four and thirteen last year. And uh, the preseason win total was six and a half. It's five and a half for this year. So they are the most popular over bet right now. So they were four and five in one score games, which means they had nine of them amongst those uh, that troubling season. 12th in pace of play, 28th in points per game. Zach Wilson was not healthy throughout, and he was not good. Accurate. The defense was also terrible, and no offensive line was maybe worse for the purposes of protecting Zach Wilson, who was sacked often. Um, so we, we come into this year and you say, hey, you've equipped him. Brees Hall, best running back in the draft, mm -hmm. now in the backfield. Michael Carter was very effective in the passing game. Elijah Moore is there. Garrett Wilson was uh, drafted very, very highly and heralded. And you look at most people and they review the draft and they say the Jets had the best draft of anybody. So you have a lot of optimism with the pieces here. Mm -hmm. How far does that go? <laughs> it, it's, and how do you draft the players around them in fantasy? I feel like it's grabbing a rock and seeing how far you can throw it. But what it's size, on, what size of a rock? Are we like talking about perfect here? baseball size okay. rock. And I go to flat throw it, or round. Just around. It's ba well, ba on baseball. Okay, it's not one of those flat it's, baseballs. It's, yeah, it's, I'm throwing like a baseball. Well, 
Uh, why didn't you, why just did say you say baseball? baseball? Well, because in my mind, I'm standing at a lake, and I don't usually throw baseballs into lakes. Well, that's why I was asking, Are you trying? is this a skipping let's, stone? Let's see where he's going. Yeah, but when I throw it, it's the, the rock <laughs> slash baseball is tied onto like a 14-foot rope that is connected to my leg. That's what it feels like because so you're strong? throwing it, and then you want it to keep going. Oh, let's keep going, but, but it just snaps. It, it, is well, it strong enough to pull you in to the water? No, or it's a baseball. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I, my, my, no. Mike's having a real trouble. <laughs> my point here is, I feel like the whole team, and this is the reason why I'm so kind of down on Zach Wilson, is because I love the pieces. I, I just love this offense. Elijah Moore is so good. Garrett Wilson is so good. You, I. No one loves Brees Hall more than I do, and I want it all to work out well, and I am I feel like when it doesn't, we all know the reason why. Um, so really, the, the optimism that I have and the hope uh, in these beautiful rock baseballs is that um, Zach Wilson can take that leap, that he can become what they drafted him to be. I mean... Yeah, and he can, because it's been one season on a terrible football team you know it wasn't too different than what trevor lawrence went through last year where both of these are number one and two pick and they sure. looked they looked terrible but that that has happened a lot in nfl history where you know you have you're giving them everything you can at the end of the year if you want to dunk on zach wilson that's fine but before the season begins it seems like you know he's got pieces he's got weapons he's got another year under his belt he was hurt for part of last year I, i'm not pretending he was good last year yeah but I think that you don't bury a guy that was on a team that all the ancillary pieces were not helpful. Elijah Moore was hurt throughout last year. Your best running back was – you were running Tevin Coleman out there a lot? Well, well, Michael Carter, Carter was their best running back. By the end they, of the year, but they were running my, they were running Tevin sure. Coleman out there every single week to start the season. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. What is the positive case for Zach Wilson? What, let's say things go right for him. He levels up. At the end of the year, we say Zach Wilson is the they got a franchise guy. Yeah. What are what are his stats? Four thousand and twenty five, and he and he keeps the interceptions down. Yeah, I can. Okay. I mean, because he started last year with like seven picks in the first three games, and he only threw four the rest of the way. So you got to control that. You go out there and you go twenty five and fourteen, and you throw for four thousand yards, and you're you're better than six win team. So to me. The good case for Zach Wilson, 4,025, which that – fantastic. But that you try to split that up between Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, uh, a rookie Garrett Wilson. You know, you're, you're not splitting up 4,535. Uh, 4,025, as the, as the bullish case, just seems like you're going to be disappointed with a lot of the receiving options. Now, if that comes through and the offense is, is good and he's a future franchise guy, obviously, Brees Hall seems set. You know, that he probably had a great season, but I just don't see the receiving options working out well in redraft leagues uh, for this season. For this season. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it for sure. I mean, Jimmy G obviously missed a few games. He was he threw 20 touchdowns last year. You, you're going to need a lot of work done, and Vegas obviously, obviously doesn't see this team making the leap this year. It's a tough division. You play New England twice. You play Buffalo twice. You play Miami twice. I mean, it's the most brutal division to be in, so even if you project a better future for the Jets, it could be the same this season. So for Brees Hall, going in the fourth round, Jay, you're good with that ADP? He's an auto pick for me in the fourth okay. round. I, I, I am, I'm very happy to take him in the fourth. Like, in the running back dead zone, at least you're getting you're getting youth, you're getting athleticism, and we don't know yet for sure. We don't know what the the plan is for Brees Hall, but to me, when you and they did they trade up? I, I now I have a memory of them moving up. A yeah, they moved picks. up a pick or something. They moved like up a, uh, moved up a couple picks to make sure they got Brees Hall. It came out after the draft that they were trying to get back into the first round to get Brees Hall. Uh, so they this was they desired him to be on the team. He has a three down skill set, and I think that that's very possible that he week one he has a three down set. Even if a, even if it's a bad team and Zach Wilson doesn't fully utilize checking it down to the running back, that's still massive volume for for a young guy in the fourth. Yeah, I mean rookie running backs with his profile 
they do well. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of red flags here, but if you're saying, you know, the, the yeah. offensive line is better than what Najee had last year, if you're saying, like, the biggest red flag is Michael Carter. Well, no, the biggest red flag is that they are going to win four games. They ran the ball less than anybody in football last year, and you're going to be playing from behind constantly. So if he doesn't get a lot of third down, you've got a first and second down running back on one of the lowest scoring teams in football who's playing from behind. I mean, they gave up more points than anybody in football last year on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the worst case for me. That's that's why when you've got a uh, a back like this with great production also in the receiving game, it's you know you you hope and maybe that's where the Michael Carter fears come in because he is a capable pass catcher as well. You hope that if they're down, they're still involving Brees Hall in the offense because he is one of their best playmakers. And so if he's involved in the passing game, he'll he'll be a great pick. Uh, Garrett Wilson. Elijah Moore, both eighth-round yeah. picks right now. People are basically flipping a coin and deciding which one to take. As of right now, I'm going to go. I'll go with Elijah Moore. Targeted on 24% of his routes. That's the tenth best among rookie wide receivers since 20, uh, 2014. And yes, like I, I can, make, I can make an outstanding case against Elijah Moore. Mostly because the, Zach Wilson wasn't there for the production for Elijah Moore. It was other and Garrett guys. Wilson wasn't there. Right, but. We know that he can ball. Like there were no Wilsons around when Moore was doing this. Exactly, but like just watch watch some tape of Elijah Moore. He's good. And second year wide receivers, they uh, off like running backs with Brees Hall's profile. They do well. Second year wide receivers, they often do very well as as well. Uh, so <laughs> I would take him well over Wilson. All's well point. that ends well. Yes, for Elijah Moore, hopefully. All right, it's underdog fantasy time. Best Ball Breakdown, presented by Underdog Fantasy. All right, so today on our, our Best Ball Breakdown, we are looking at the last round of your best ball drafts. It often feels like it's like a throwaway pick. You're in the 18th round. There's names of you you're know, exhausted. You, you know, there's names of guys you you don't necessarily like. But we did a deep dive and we looked at best ball rosters over the last seven years and guys that are going past pick 200. So basically that last round and some of these players over the last few years have been absolute steals. You got in 2018, James Connor uh, was drafted at the 200. Was awesome. You have players, um, Hunter Renfro last year was on average the 222nd drafted player. He finished as a top 12 wide receiver. Terry McLaurin back in 2019, uh, you know, the, the list goes on and on. And so from last year, you have Cord Cordero Patterson, Elijah Mitchell, Daryl Williams, Hunter Renfro, Kendrick Bourne, Tim Patrick at tight end, Dawson Knox, Dalton Schultz. These guys were massive different makers for best ball leagues and that was in your last round so we wanted to give you some names of guys that fit what these last round guys uh the steals this the steals so the difference makers so at at uh running back right uh you want guys that maybe an injury ahead of them vault them forward and they have pass catching in their profile here's some running backs that fit that in the last round Jarek McKinnon, sure, uh, he's been available there from time to time. He dominated in the playoffs, averaged basically 100 all-purpose yards last year, and that was with Clyde Edwards-Alaire there. Chris Evans. That, that's a name I like to bring up. Uh, Chris Evans from the Cincinnati Bengals heading into year two. I mean, he's this is these are low-probability odds, but again, it's your last pick in best ball. He was a six-round pick, so the draft capital is not there. But the way that things are being talked about, at, at least for you know beat reporters and things out of Cincinnati, should Joe Mixon miss time, it sounds like Chris Evans will be the primary replacement. Again, we, we talk about insurance running backs. It's hard to know right now exactly who it'll be. But as of this recording, it seems like Evans will be the one that takes over. And when you're in best ball and you know in these tournaments and things, you just you, you kind of need everything to go right. Yeah, uh, he. I think he would be a, a, a dominating uh, running back given the opportunity. You have Eno Benjamin uh, from the Cardinals. Daryl Williams drafted way, way, way above him, and and I 
think Daryl Williams will have that job? Yeah, Andy, are you still that? Darryl I think Williams? Daryl will probably get it. I do too. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that. I mean, as the drafters do as well. But it's not a lock. That's not a done deal. Who the backup is? If you listen to beat reporters around the Cardinals, uh, Dearness Johnson fits that with two guys ahead of him that could get injured. And Tyler Beatty. We've, yeah. We've talked about him uh, recently. Baltimore. Dude looks like a Beatty. Wah-ha! Wah-ha! <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Okay. It's <laughs> my only contribution to well, this I mean, entire segment. Look, look, I mean, you know, I I love Aerosmith <laughs> very much. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a big fan of Dude Looks Like a Beatty. Um, <laughs> it, would that be like an official nickname? Like I, I don't know, man. Tyler He's... Dude Looks Like, like his nickname is Dude Looks Like? Yeah! A baby. Um, but, you know, Baltimore, a lot of injury worries with J.K. Dobbins, even with Gus Edwards, uh, rookie running back there. So the wide receivers, uh, there's usually five wide receivers per year above expectation. Those are most commonly second-year wide receivers who bottomed yes. out in year one. Rookies drafted third round or later in the NFL draft, but who can start right away. And veteran wide receivers who never broke out but are younger than 27 years old. Here's a list. Write them down. <laughs> Terrace Marshall Jr. Now, unless you're did, driving. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay safe out there. Did you put Terrace Marshall on this list or was that Kyle? You know it was Kyle. Kyle is the biggest Terrace Marshall fan. I feel stand. like this, this entire tip and segment was crafted just to make us talk about Terrace Marshall Jr. And, but we're done with that part. We are done with that part. Why don't yeah! both of you guys give me your favorite <laughs> late round wide receiver target? So with, with the late picks, I. I prefer the the young, the upside guys. Um, so like it doesn't feel great at this point, but like Valus Jones for the Chicago Bears was a second round pick. There is a huge opportunity for the Chicago Bears in terms of can anyone on that offense other than Darnell Mooney as a pass catcher step up? Because I mean they're having like just tons of off the field problems. They don't. No one's locked into that second wide receiver spot. So throughout the season, Velas could be that guy. And Jalen Guyton's been getting or third the third round pick. Thank Jaylen you. Jalen Guyton in Los Angeles has been getting headlines recently. Um, just how he's coming into the season. Everyone wants Josh Palmer. He's going much higher. But Jalen Guyton, especially in a best ball format, when I mean, you're going to get what he's got, which is speed. You're going to get those incredible sixty yard back foot Justin Herbert yep. blow your mind. And that's going to be Guyton on the other end. Yeah, 100%. And, and um, you know, you brought up Valus Jones. You could stack him pretty easily with yeah. with uh, Fields. Fields and, and Zay Jones. They gave Zay Jones a lot of money. They and, did. You know, it's he's going to be involved. This isn't like the – you're not going to get the 60-yard touchdown as often, but I do think he will have uh, plenty of weeks that can crack your lineup for a last uh, a last round guy. And finally, tight ends. Tight ends, you're looking for an opportunity and a good offense. Can they hit eight touchdowns? Um, you know, is, is that possible in their range of outcomes? Moali Cox. It would, well, hold on. Like in one game? <laughs> right, yes. I mean, then if, if anyone on this list can hit eight touchdowns in one game, it would be Gigantor Moali Cox. I think if Cox. a man that big scores, they count it as eight touchdowns. Yeah, when you can spike the ball into the ground. Um. Here's another name I like. I, I think I stand alone. Is it Janu? No, of course it's not Janu. <laughs> How dare you? Um, no, it's it's OJ Howard. Um, okay. Nobody wants him. He's behind. You know, Dawson Knox is the you. You might be saying OJ Howard. Where who who's he playing for? He's a Buffalo Bill. Uh, oh, I'm, him and Evan Ingram. He can make up your like tandems. Yeah. So I just think you know if I want a quarterback that's going to throw thirty five. Touchdowns, right? Josh Allen's yeah. gonna Kate, throw. Kate Otten in Tampa Bay fit that. Kate Otten, I mean, could, I, yeah. I think the obviously Gronk is gone, he's not coming back, mm -hmm. and we've seen the Cameron Braid experiment, experiment, and it's not a, it's not a special one anymore. Yeah, I would, I would throw Kate Otten in there. Brevin Jordan is another name. I would take Brevin over Cade, personally. That's that's tough. I mean, yeah, if you're saying who probably twice as many touchdowns thrown by yeah, Mr. But, Thomas. I mean, exactly. I'll, I, I will not bet on rookie tight ends. It is tough to bet. I on will rookie not do that, ends. especially but, ones that are not drafted in the first round. Okay. Or the, right. or the second round. Any other names? Or the third round. Uh, you could maybe draft Taysom Hill and hope that maybe he gets some quarterback uh, play in there. 
No. Okay. No. All right. I will not. All right. That was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. Start playing on Underdog today, right now. They'll match your first deposit up to $100 if you use the code BALLERS. That is going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. Don't forget we're back with a Saturday release of the show before we get to five days a week in August. Thank you so much for tuning in, supporting the show at jointhefoot.com. Make sure you check out the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. Until next time, Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, and the Deucers, farewell. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.